week, I am going to do a sermon called the State of the Church Address. <laughs> All right, kind of like the State of the Union Address. Just kind of let you guys know what the state of the church is, uh, what things look like moving forward, uh, some, some ideas and moving parts that we have kind of in the fire for 2021. I'm not going to call it Vision Sunday because uh, it's kind of hard right now to have vision beyond like two weeks because <laughs> everything changes so much. Uh, but we have some business plans and some business ideas that we'd like to pitch to you uh, next week. So stay to the church address. It'll, have a, it'll be a sermon, but it's a lot of information about where we're going. We plan on, read my lips, we plan on staying open as long as we can. All right? All right? For those that are wondering with yellow zone, orange zone, red zone, we've, we've, not, we've not done anything other than yellow zone since the shutdown. So them implementing yellow zone, it's exactly what we're already doing. All right, so um, we haven't changed anything. We're just being consistent and trying to be as safe as possible. So we'll address some things next week. But happy Thanksgiving this week. This is the week, and just in a few days, you will consume more calories in two hours than you will in two months, all right? You will have over a 1,000 calories just in your mom's sweet potato pie, huh? And then you're going to have a little food hangover and fall asleep watching football. Thanksgiving is going to be great. We find ourselves in the middle of a series called Literally. Literally. And uh, I had the pleasure, my, my daughter had a few friends over last night, and I listened to them speak, and they used the word literally, literally 40 times in like a 15-minute conversation, this word literally. And the word literally doesn't have to mean literally anymore, right? I'm literally dead. Obviously, you're not literally dead, or you couldn't say the word, right? So the word literally now means figuratively or literally or whatever you want to do. So today, I am really in this like ornery mood. Is that okay? Can I be ornery today? And I want to talk about the literal meaning of the word repentance. Repentance. The word repentance is a trigger word for me. And I almost called this sermon triggered. That's another buzzword. Kids talk about all the time. Oh my God, I just got triggered. And that just means I got upset. Um, I almost called this one triggered because the word repentance is like a trigger word for me because there's a lot of churches talking about the word repentance, yet they don't actually understand it. They use it as a phrase. They use it as a word out of the Bible out of context. And I'm not going to stand here today and blast anybody. I'm not going to come against anybody. I'm not calling anybody out. I'm not calling any churches out. Although I, I totally in my honoriness would love to. I will not. My goal today is to inspire you and instruct you, teach from a theological point of view uh, for those who are in the room, those who are watching online, so that we can understand the true and literal meaning of New Testament repentance. Is that okay? Is that all right today? And we're gonna tie this word repentance into another word called grace. So today we're talking about repentance and grace. Here's my dilemma. I'm talking about me for a moment. So you do not have to agree with me. But here is my dilemma with the word repentance and how it's been taught in the church today. And not, not just today, but my entire life. Repent! And so when we use the word repent, that meant we were about to hand out a lot of tissues. We were about to go through some tissues because people had to come forward. With the, church, the band had to play something in D minor. You go into D minor because you can't repent unless the band is in D minor that puts you in this light mood, had to turn the lights down because nobody can see you. And you come to the front and you had to cry. And you had to be sorry. And you had to mourn 
all the bad things you did and give them over to the Lord. And then the, the pastors and the worship team, they would all stand back and, they'd, and they would all take credit for your repentance. I have a problem with that. I have a problem with that. Now again, I'm poking fun. This is me. I'm ornery today. Okay? This is me poking fun. Because you better know your boy was up at the front, booger face, snot, cry the whole nine. I was in it to win it back then. But I always had a problem with it because I was acting. I didn't feel sorry for what I had done, but I knew if I didn't play the game, I was going to hell. Can, can, nobody can identify old school church. The, the band had two modes. If the Holy Spirit was going to move, the band either had doom, 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 or it had D minor, come to the altar. Okay. So you know where I'm at. You can identify for a moment, okay? But let's look at this word repentance in the Bible. It is the Greek word metanoia. Metanoia. I have to say it like my brother Vincent over here. Metanoia. And the word metanoia in the Greek simply means afterthought or beyond thought. Afterthought or beyond thought. Metanoia which is what the word repentance in the Bible has been translated into the English too. Metanoia means afterthought or beyond thought, meaning once I considered what you said, once I heard what you said, I changed my thinking after I thought about it. That's all the word means. After I thought about what was just said, after I thought about what was just heard, beyond thinking... I believed, I changed my thinking to this, to what you just instructed me. But that is not what the English word repentance means. And that's where we find the problem. Because the English word repentance, what we identify as the word repentance, ties itself to the word sorrow. Sorrow. To feel an emotion of sorrow, to feel regret, to feel grief, to feel remorse. And can we just be honest for a second and just take off our church faces? We've all done things that we know to be wrong that we did not feel bad about at all. When that person cut you off on 17 the other day, and you wave to them without a whole hand. <laughs> and you drove off. Did you just start crying? Oh, I'm convicted by the Holy Spirit. No, you had to tell everybody how upset you were and how justified you were because they cut you off. There was no sorrow for, how, for what you did. You didn't feel bad about it. Let's just be honest. I'm just being, now there are some times that we do stuff and we just know that we were straight up wrong and we do feel bad. So there, there, there are both sides to it. But what I'm saying is, is that when the church world uses this word repentance, we're not using the Greek metanoia, we're using Webster's Dictionary. And you can never define the word of God by man's definitions. You can never do it. You can never do it. The word metanoia does not demand an emotional response. We like emotional responses. We like emotional releases. I was raised in church, and listen, this is no, I'm not throwing shade, but I was raised in a church where we did Tuesday night prayer meeting and Thursday night church and then Sunday morning church and then sometimes Sunday night church if we had guest speakers. And Tuesday night prayer meeting consisted of 30 minutes of screaming at the devil in tongues. And oh boy, it felt great. But it didn't really change a whole lot. We just had this emotional response where we had an outlet to target our anger at the devil 
and let it out and then we were exhausted afterwards. I'm not dogging, church. I'm talking about me here. This is my life experience. But it didn't always lead to mind change that should lead to behavior change. Emotional release is just over in the moment. Laughter, crying, screaming. You did it, it's done. But metanoia, changing of a mind, changing of reasoning, changing how I process things, changes a life. So let's just look at this. Let's look at Matthew 3, verse 1. It's John the Baptist's kind of preaching. He's walking into the land and says, in the days of John the Baptist, he came preaching in the wilderness of Judea saying this, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, where is he? In the wilderness, which means they're not in a church service, which means they don't have an altar with a band playing in D minor for you to come cry. There's no emotion that needs to be tied to what John the Baptist is preaching. He's saying, change your thinking. You're waiting for someday for the Messiah to arrive. You're waiting someday to experience the kingdom. And I'm saying, change your thinking. The kingdom is here. The kingdom is now. After, after you hear what I'm about to say, change the way you look at this. God is here. Metanoia. Metanoia. Rethink the kingdom. Jesus is here. He was not asking you to start crying. He was not asking you to feel sorry about your life. There was no salvation, so he couldn't even give you salvation. He's saying, change your thinking. Change your thinking. See it, understand it, believe it. So where do we get the teaching of remorse? Remorse. Where do we get this teaching of remorse? Where do we get this teaching that we have to feel bad? And, and, and let me just say something to you real quick. I believe it's one of the vices of the enemy is to steal your joy by reminding you every day how bad you are. That is not the work of the Holy Spirit. That is crippling. It is crippling to look at yourself and not be happy with yourself every single day day that does not advance the kingdom of God. But where do we get it from? I believe a lot of churches get it from 2 Corinthians 7 verse 8. Let's see what God says, what the Bible says about repentance. Ready? What I'm about to read to you, I'm reading to you through the lenses of how it's taught, but not how it's supposed to be preached, in my theological opinion. 2 Corinthians 7, 8. Paul is writing, this is his second letter to the church of Corinth because it's 2 Corinthians, right? 1 Corinthians was his first one. Many believe that in Romans and Acts, he may have been addressing other places as well and, and writings to Corinthian, the Corinthian church because they were in a bad way. And his first letter he wrote to them had some corrective and some harsh words. And now he's writing a second letter. Watch what he says here. Even if I caused you sorrow by my first letter, I do not regret it. Don't you just love how he is? That's like a mom. She just spanked your bottom. You're all crying. And she's like, I know you're crying, but I don't regret spanking you. Right? That's what we say here. I don't regret it. Though I did regret it at first. Though at first, after I wrote it, I did question myself over and over and over again. Did I need to use those kind of words? Did I need to speak that way? Was that a little too harsh? But only for a little while. And then I pushed that behind me. Yet I'm happy now. Just, he's all over the place right here. He's like, he don't know what to think. I was, but then I'm not, but now I am. Not because I made you sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended 
and so were not harmed in any way by us. But godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. So let's look at this verse today. Let's break this down and let's see exactly what's going on. First and foremost, Paul is saying, I wrote the letter, then I regretted it. So what he is saying is, some of this letter could have been on his own accord. He might have added some angry words. Come on, let's just, I'm not, I'm not negating scripture, I'm telling you what this is saying here. I regretted it, because it hurts you, but then it didn't, because of the outcome. And what churches have taught is that this Verse is the formula for repentance when it is not. This verse is not the formula for repentance. This verse is simply stating a fact of what happened. Do a Google search. How do I repent? And it'll say, for godly sorrow leads to repentance. So you can't repent unless you have sorrow. That's not what this just said. He said, I wrote this letter, it hurt your feelings, and it made you sad. But I thank God, because that godly sorrow, it led you to repent. It's a fact. It literally occurred. But it does not mean that that is the formula for repentance. All right, let's just look at this. Your son, Johnny, you tell him, don't play in the street. Johnny goes and plays in the street. He gets hit by a car, breaks his leg. He has to go to the hospital, have surgery on his leg. While he's in the hospital having surgery on his leg, there's another Johnny in the bed next to him. And that Johnny loves Jesus. And that Johnny tells your Johnny about Jesus, and Johnny gets saved. Now, do we all got to go play in the road and break our leg to find Jesus? No, it's a statement of fact. It's not the formula to repentance. Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo. You ain't gonna have nobody preach you that. You ain't gonna have nobody preach you that. And why won't the church preach you that? Because I can control you by making you feel bad. And then all I have to say is, thus saith the Lord. Now I got a lot of power. I got a lot of power when I say, if you don't feel bad about your sin and come to this altar right now when Brian plays D minor on the guitar, you don't love Jesus. It's as manipulative as Facebook when it says, if you don't share this meme, you don't love Jesus. And just so you know, I never share those memes. And I love Jesus with my whole heart. Hey, somebody. He's saying, this is what has happened. I wrote this letter under the unction of the Holy Spirit to you. And it hit something within you. And it brought you to a place that you came to God. And for that, I rejoice. And in this moment, God used this letter that I went back and forth, whether I should write it or not, for his glory and his honor, because godly sorrow led to repentance. But for some reason, we miss the second part of the sentence. Godly sorrow that led to a change of thinking, repentance, that led to what? Salvation. It led to salvation. It led to salvation. It led to, if they got saved, it means they weren't saved. This wasn't even written to you. This wasn't even written about you. This was written to someone who needed to find Jesus, who needed to find salvation not where a Christian is supposed to live every single time they fall short of perfection of God's glory. Come on, somebody. I know, I know. I've been in the word like 
90 hours this week researching this one. I know this is deep theology that the church has gotten wrong. How can I have joy in the Holy Ghost if I'm constantly feeling bad about a bad thought that went through my mind? Who wants you to feel bad? Who wants you to live in regret? Who wants you to live in remorse? Oh, my Bible says that there is an enemy out there who is called the accuser of the brethren. In my life, I made a determining factor in my life. Nobody gets to go fishing in my sea of forgetfulness. No one gets to go fishing in my past to dig up mistakes to put it in my face. That's under the blood. Now, Pastor Mike, there's never times, oh, I go to the Lord all the time. I confess my mistakes all the time. I do it all the time multiple times a day. But what that is, is not repentance. It's confession. It's me coming to the Lord saying, Lord, I'm still dealing with this one thing. I'm asking you to empower me and help me and strengthen me. How many times can I change my thinking about the same thing? Once I change my thinking to the truth, it's the truth. Whether I have the ability every single moment of every single day to live to that new truth That's called the battle of the flesh. But I did make my mind align to what the word of God says. All right, let's move on. Paul says to the church, this is my second corrective letter. This is what has happened. And for that, I rejoice. He says that godly sorrow led you to repentance that led you to salvation. This is a statement of fact. And I'm going to tell you this. If you've ever felt what, what he is calling godly sorrow, it is for one purpose and one purpose only, to lead you to salvation. To lead you to salvation. All the other things when you feel bad about doing something wrong, that's because you violated your moral compass. You violated your conscience. Your mom and dad raised you. Don't do this. And you went and did it. And deep inside of you, in your inter- inner man, who you are, was grieved by that. You violated your moral compass. Now you feel bad. Now what you do is instead of taking your thought captive, you let your mind replay it over and over. I mean, your mind is the best record player stuck on one line, skipping over and over and over again. And then that creates anxiety. Anxiety is the record player that skips and plays over and over and over and over and over and over and over over again that same situation. That is not God doing that to you. I would never try to make my kids depressed and full of anxiousness. And I'm not a perfect person. I would n- so why would God? What would be the point? Because God would never do anything without a point. If he brought you godly sorrow, it was for one purpose, to lead you to salvation. Salvation. So now we got to look at this word salvation. Salvation in this passage is the Greek word soteria. Boop, there it is. In this passage. Now, this word is bigger than I'm saved so I can go to heaven. Soteria is the noun salvation. From the verb salvation, sozo. Sozo is the verb. Sotaria is the noun of this word salvation. It means to rescue, to have safety, to deliver, to bring health, to bring healing, to be 
saved. Soso is the action of saving, where soltaria is the person, place, or thing that is being saved. You are the subject matter in that that he will bring you to a metanoia situation so that you would be saved. And you are saved by a person, Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus. Godly sorrow that would lead to eternal life, that would lead to deliverance, that would lead to healing. It does not lead to you feeling bad about yourself. Mm. And the Bible says this, and the godly sorrow that leads to salvation, read it, remember? And it leaves you with no regret. Where worldly sorrow leads to death. You know why worldly sorrow leads to death? Because it brings depression, self-hatred, and no salvation. So you could have sorrow all the time. You could have worldly sorrow day in and day out, feeling bad about yourself. But if it never leads to deliverance, if it never leads to healing, if it never leads to safety, you got to say, who is bringing this at me? And it's not God. Mm. The word metanoia has a nemesis. Anybody know what a nemesis is? An opposite counterpart. If metanoia is good, then there's another word just like it that is evil. The opposite counterpart to metanoia, and you guys know it, it's paranoia. Paranoia. And that's what the enemy wants for your life, and that's the word that lots of churches preach. Not metanoia, paranoia. Paranoid of everything. Paranoid of not being good enough for God. Paranoid of the devil. And that is not what Jesus Christ gave his life for. Jesus Christ did not give his life for paranoia. The word repentance in the English language can almost be perfectly tied to the word paranoia metanoia, changing of your thoughts and, 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 and actions can never be tied to the word paranoia. Never can be. Totally not the same thing. In the classic, classical Greek, the word metanoia was personified. You tell me if I'm wrong after church. Don't shout me out in front of everybody. Metanoia was depicted as a shadowy goddess cloaked and sorrowful, who accompanied Kairos, the god of opportunity. So, sowing regret and inspiring repentance for the missing moments of life. Could you imagine that? Feeling bad all the time about moments that you missed? Man, that does sound a lot like some stuff we preach. You missed the Lord. You missed the decision. You missed the business venture. You missed your kids. You were out making money for your kids and you left your kids at home and you missed this time. Church world wasn't preaching metanoia. We were teaching mythology. Come on. This conventional portrayal continued through the Renaissance. The elements of repentance, regret, reflection, and transformation were always present in that idealism of pagan beliefs. And this is why the apostles came so hard at the word metanoia. Change your thinking. Change your thinking from this blend of pagan religion and Christianity, change your thinking. Change your thinking. So today as we begin to close, if, if I have offended you or majorly confused you, I apologize. But like Paul, 
Not really. <laughs> but then again, I could be. But if it leads to a change in your life, I'm more than happy to offend you. <laughs> Don't teach pagan values to your kids. When you find your kid doing something wrong, don't stand there and belittle them until they cry. What's wrong with you? Is there something wrong with you? Why would you do something like that and keep going until they break? That wasn't godly sorrow. They're not even sorry. You hurt their feelings. You broke their spirit. And you're telling them they missed the moment. They missed something. They were wrong. And that's never going to lead to life change and them being better. It's going to change. It's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to make something happen. As soon as you walk out of the room, they're going to curse you out behind your back. They're not going to trust you to come tell you something when they mess up because they don't want to be belittled and talked down. Like, like, let's not keep this cycle of this going. Let's not preach this gospel, this half gospel, where it's sometimes good news and sometimes not good news. The only leading of repentance needs to be unto salvation. Here's my translation of the word metanoia as it speaks to me. Put up on the screen. Change of thought that leads to change of heart. Change of thought that leads to change of heart. And then we can take this a third step. Change of thought leads to change of heart that leads to change of behavior. It will lead to change of action. And ultimately, 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 that's what you're being judged for. is not the thought, not the heart, but what you're doing with it. What we're doing with the gospel. What we're doing with the good news. The, the, the big problem with the teaching of repentance is that others want to stand back and they want to judge if you had truly repented or not. Did they truly repent? Did they truly repent? Now, let me just tell you guys something. God isn't asking any one of us to do that. God is not asking any one of us to come back and say, did they truly repent? You don't know someone's heart. You don't know someone's heart. You don't know what someone's dealing with. You don't know what someone's been through. You don't know someone's life story. Lead them to the goodness of God. The Bible says this, it is the goodness of God that leadeth man to metanoia. It's the goodness of God that leads man to a change. Wait, wait, this is God? This is God in this moment? This feels good. We were singing this song, uh, you know, amen, and I felt something and it came alive. Wait, this is good? This is God? It's the goodness of God that leads man to repentance. So Pastor Mike, are you preaching some kind of watered down gospel? Are you preaching some kind of watered down grace? Are you preaching some kind of cheap grace? How dare the church world think that there is some way you can water down the fact that Jesus Christ gave his life and all you have to do is confess it with your mouth and believe it in your heart. God's not asking you to hang on a cross. How can you balance someone giving their life for me? I can't balance that. I can't balance that table. I can't make it more valuable, nor can I cheapen it because it's a finished work. It stands alone. It stands alone without my interpretation or my willpower. It's a finished work that stands alone. That's the revelation that we need. Romans 2, 3, and 4 says this. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same thing, do you think you're going to escape God's judgment? So you're trying to judge people with God's judgment, but yet you're doing the same thing. Do you think you're going to not be judged? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness? Do you, do you show, oh, look what it says here. 
You showing contempt for God's grace by judging other people? And his forbearance and his patience, not realizing that God's kindness, God's goodness leads you to metanoia. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says this, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself, not of your own work, not of your ability to repent. If there was something you could do to earn God's grace, you literally don't know the definition of grace. Literally, Grace means unearned favor. If you have to do something in order to get it, it's not grace. <laughs> if you have to repent to get it, it's not grace. It's unearned, undeserved, unmerited. He gives it. It is a gift of God. Look at this. Not by works. I'm sorry. Uh, not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, so you cannot boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God prepared in advance. Put this up on the screen, the word charis. Charis. And that's how I say it. I don't know how else to say it. Charis is the word grace. Unearned. Undeserved. Acceptance. Benefits. Favor. Gifts. Grace, joy, liberty. Free. Free of charge. Don't have to deserve it. Don't have to earn it. And in fact, if you did earn it, it's not grace. It's some, it's some sort of pagan thing. It, it, this is what Martin Luther got so upset about when he... When he started the Protestant Reformation. He said, I'm not going to pay you money to have my sins forgiven. I'm not going to pay penance. If I have to pay for it, it's not forgiveness. This is why Paul wants us to have metanoia. Hear me today. Just, just get this. Get, get, get this one part. It all boils down to this. The reason why he kept using the word metanoia was so that you would change your thinking about grace. If you think for one second that you're in and out of grace because you do bad things, you need to change your thinking. You can't. This is what he's saying. This is the depth of it. And this is the thing that I fight the church world about. The actual thing they're trying to preach, this repentance, this sorrow, is what he's saying you have to metanoia from. Literally. You're literally preaching the exact opposite gospel than the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word gospel literally means the two good to be true news. It's too good to be true news. That's why they called about the good news, but they kind of just took off the front part. Too good to be true. Pastor Mike, what you're saying today is just too good to be true. That's grace. That's the free gift. And we only get there through metanoia. And I could understand how strange they were looking at John when he was preaching this because I get some strange looks right now. <laughs> what do you mean the kingdom's here? What do you mean that he loves me just the way that I am? What do you mean it's not about my behavior? If it was ever about your behavior, then you could do and undo salvation all the time. If you can do and undo salvation all the time, then the cross was a bad plan. And I'm telling you right now, God Almighty would never offer his son as a sacrifice for the sin of all mankind if you could mess it up. If you could mess it up. He wouldn't do it. What's our part to play? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. 
but, but there's got, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. You do that, that's a 40-hour work week. That's a 40-hour work week right there. Loving God and loving some neighbors. I'm telling you this today. I believe in my spirit. I believe in my spirit that there is a revival stirring in the hearts of believers. And this revival is not going to be more judgment. Oh my God, if I, if I could blast all the prophets online right now who are talking about the judgment of God. Listen, let me just close out with this. And I just, someone's gonna misquote me, so I need to be very clear. If the next move of God before the rapture, before the church is gone, is judgment, then the redemptive work of the cross was a failure. All judgment for all sin was placed on Jesus on the cross. He went, he died, paid that price, went down into hell, raised up victoriously, ascended into heaven, placed his blood on the mercy seat of heaven, and he sat down. It's finished. Well, Pastor Mike, but the Bible does say that God's going to come back and judge the earth. Yeah, when all the Christians are gone. Let's just look at his motto. He delivered Noah and his family before judgment hit the earth. He, he, he removed Abraham and Lot before he judged Sodom and Gomorrah. He always delivers his people before something like that would happen. After the rapture, a judgment will come and the earth will be destroyed and the heavens will be destroyed and there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. But guess what? I will already be in his grace, in his mercy, in his arms. Woo! That's too good to be true news and that's what the gospel's about and that's what the blood of Jesus did. Father, we thank you today that your word will never return void, but it will accomplish exactly what you set it forth to do, Lord. Uh, I make this very clear across the, the wave lines, Lord. If I grieved you in any way, if I misspoke theologically, Lord, I, 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 I lay that before you right now, uh, somebody will correct me. Absolutely. But Lord, I believe that this is the message that you gave me to preach in this house for your people to hear that we would live a life of deliverance freed from the bondages and chains that try to hold us back, that we will live a life of joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness. And we can only do that if we're freed from the mindsets of sorrow. Lord, we thank you that the Holy Spirit is our comforter, our guide, that he leads us into all truth. Lord, I pray today that we can have mind change that leads to heart change, that leads to behavior change. As we leave here today, Lord, I thank you that we are blessed. Everything we set our hands to would prosper and be successful. In Jesus' name, amen.